Good afternoon. The Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome our attendees today for this Fulbright Forum in honor of Earth Day. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for U.S. alumni. We connect alumni, friends of the Fulbright program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 54 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the U.S. This year's programming is particularly special since it is the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. Focused on international issues, the Fulbright Forum series features extraordinary speakers from around the world. Our topic today is global sea level rise and our changing coastal future. I will now hand it over to Dr. Alex Coker, who will be moderating today's forum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am pleased to, uh, to be here to welcome all of you to this session. Uh, my name is Alex Coker, and I'm a coastal scientist at the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium. I will share my screen with you and so that uh, uh, I will share my, uh, excuse me, I will share my screen with you. Uh, uh, excuse me. Sorry for this technical glitch, uh, share screen. Uh, I'm a coastal scientist from the Louis. I'm a coastal scientist at the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium. Um, and I'm here to talk, to give it this uh, introduction on our changing coastal future. Uh, coast, coasts are imp valued environments across the world for many, many, many reasons. There are important places for fisheries, ports, energy, housing. Of course, many, many people live in the coastal zone. There's, they're important for industry, recreation. Some of our world's most important biodiversity resources are by the coast. They're important for security. They're beautiful places too. Many, much of the world, they're important because so much of the world's population lives by the water. Many of our world's, of the world's largest cities are coastal. Uh, think New York, London, uh, Bangkok, Dhaka. Uh, and of course the coastal population in the world is increasing. Many of the world's population is moving to the coast. So this is a graph of coastal population in 2000 and a projection for the coastal population in 2060. The number of people living in the coastal zone is going to increase. The number of, um, of large cities in the coastal zone is going to increase. When we think of the coastal zone, some people might just think of a day at the beach, but people live in coastal zones for a variety of reasons. This is a view from Aqaba, Jordan with um, a lot Israel in the background. It's an area where the people use as their home and also for recreation. This is an area in Ganvi, Benin, where people live quite close to the water. And the water is a part of their daily life. A lot of our cultural and coastal history, our cultural history is by the water. This is from Safi, Morocco, uh, just showing so much of our heritage is in the coastal zone. And this is a scene from, from Louisiana in the USA, not too far from, from where I live and where I work, showing some of the vast industry uh, that relies on, on the coastal zone and that is so close to sea level. And of course, sea level is changing. These are graphs from NASA and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showing on the top right, the realized uh, climate, uh, sea level rise over the last century showing uh, several set, set showing uh, rates of sea level rise increasing from uh, a centimeter, a millimeter a year or less about a hundred years ago to over three millimeters a year today. This sea level is supposed to, is projected to, to rise over the next uh, century, uh, reaching possibly over a meter in some cases, depending on the sea level projection that is used. So what, what will our coach, coastal future look like? What, how will we deal with this, with this changing future and this changing coastal zone? We have today, we've got a great panel, <clears throat> a great panel. <clears throat> 
we have a great panel here to, to discuss this. We've got uh, Dr. Mansur Rahman from, the, uh, from, from Bangladesh, uh, who is an expert, in, who is uh, a director of the, the flood program uh, in, in Bangladesh and is an expert on the sort of hydrogeology and environmental resources in Bangladesh. We have Dr. Samira Idlilin, who uh, from Morocco, from Kadi Ayad University <clears throat> in Morocco. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Idlilin was also my, uh, one of my sponsors and affiliates uh, when I was a Fulbrighter in Morocco. Uh, and we have Al uh, Doc, uh, Alexandra, ha Alexandra Harrington, from, uh, from Albany Law School in New York, uh, who's also an environmental lawyer uh, who, um, who, is, who did a Fulbright in Canada and has looked at uh, treaties and migration rights in, re in relation to climate change. Um, I think we've got a great panel here. Each one of these panels, uh, panelists will give uh, a talk on their work lasting about 15 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a moderated discussion. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, and with that, I'll turn this over to Monser. Yeah, thank you, Alex, for uh, your nice uh, introduction. Um, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, here with this forum and uh, to be able to introduce uh, uh, the coastal challenges uh, in Bangladesh, uh, especially uh, the GBM Delta in Bangladesh. So uh, the GBM, the, the Ganges Bhumibhutra Meghna Delta in Bangladesh uh, is the exit point of uh, three big basins like Ganges, Bhumibhutra and Meghna. Uh, which is draining a big mass land mass and then entering uh, to Bangladesh and the emptying to the Bay of Bengal. And uh, uh, as you, uh, you, you can see, uh, the draining from Ganges, Bhumiputra, and Meghna are uh, in, in combination of a number of different constitution of the minerals, nutrients, etc. And as a result, the delta environment is very, very uh, fertile, productive. And it is the basket, food basket for fisheries, vegetable, agriculture, etc. And as a result of this, uh, this area are highly populated, densely populated. If you compare with the neighboring countries, around five to two to five times uh, high population density, as Alex already mentioned, the population density, the population is uh, is big in the coastal uh, uh, area. But if you compare with the neighboring countries, about two to five times more population density exists in, in Bangladesh. And uh, as a result of this, uh, the, uh, the, the competition, the exploration to the natural resources are also very, um, uh, very big in, in this country. And not only this, the uh, basin scale uh, diversion of the water resources in terms of the water, nutrients, sediment, etc., also impacting the lower part of this delta. So um, I'm going to uh, discuss all this issue with some particular reference of our recent research work within a group for more than a decade, uh, uh, so that we can understand the challenges and the, find the way out. So if you would like to uh, discuss the discussion point, so uh, I would like to uh, share some issues of the trade-off between the environmental resources and sustainable development in the Delta Ike environment. It is very important. And uh, uh, try to make a summary of the anthropogenic and climatic stresses in the Kathmandu scale, also in the local scale, and uh, how the long-term uh, Delta uh, planning is uh, being uh, implemented in Bangladesh. And we need to have a number of innovative techniques actually within the limited resources, uh, how we can cope with innovation in the delta environment. And uh, the sediment is the only resource, we say the brown gold to compensate the sea level rise. And uh, uh, how the available incoming sediment from the basin scale to local scale 
can be managed in an efficient way to have uh, some compensation of the sea level rise and subsidence level problems. And we need a number of tools techniques, the science-based tool techniques to, to cope with the changing environment. And uh, uh, lastly, I will try to uh, uh, make a brief storyline of the Bangladesh Delta model that will, uh, uh, that will uh, be able to uh, capture the anthropogenic and climatic stresses and consequence uh, in the system level. So all over the uh, countries uh, that can be integrated at the, at the same platform. So with this background, if you would like to have a brief look ab about the uh, uh, ecosystem services, uh, the provisioning, supporting, regulating, etc., cetera, uh, in, in terms of, uh, 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 say fisheries, forestry, agriculture, uh, uh, mangrove forests, etc. Then we can have a plenty of resources in the coastal zone of Bangladesh, and these these um, uh, services are interlinked with each other. And not only these, uh, these services are very much linked to the uh, uh, the biophysical and marine processes, which are being uh, changing with the change climatic and anthropogenic stresses. So it's very important to, to have the, the, the biophysical and marine processes intact as much as possible to receive this kind of ecosystem services in the long run. Um, uh, and if you uh, would like to see a kind of um, stresses uh, in, in, in the Delta in a brief, then we have the incoming uh, river flow and sediment nutrient, et cetera, changing at the catchment scale, the climatic changes, and also from the downstream, the climate hazard uh, events like cyclones, flooding, et cetera, changing. And these are creating a number of uh, different hazard level problems in the country and most specifically in the coastal zone, like flooding, sediment supply depletion, erosion sedimentation, sea level rise, um, salinization and subsidence. And if you would like to capture some of these issues, how to, uh, how to fight against these issues like flooding and salination, I can give you a, a brief example uh, what happened in Bangladesh. So in, in Bangladesh, uh, uh, in the coastal zone, we have uh, uh, a kind of amendment that is encircled some area like this. Um, and to protect the salinity and flooding and to increase the food production since 1960s. So the idea was to increase the food production and to have protection against salinity and flooding. But that time, the biophysical uh, dispersion of the sediment, nutrient, water flow, uh, we could not capture uh, very intelligently. As a result, uh, some part of the, the out, outside of these poldered or encircled portions are, are silted off and inside there is subsidence. There is a relative uh, bed level changes inside the, sea, inside the polder and outside the polder. That is creating some additional challenges to us like um, when the embankment fails because of some event and then the prolonged autologging related problems. And if you would like to have a global scale, uh, the regional scale autologging auto problems, we have the range of bouldered area, and we have we can see the water logging, uh, the extent uh, extension of the area in terms of the water logging. So the water logging is a kind of uh, obvious uh, result, and uh, we are struggling how to handle this kind of problems. And uh, uh, to handle this, Bangladesh government uh, recently. Uh, uh, formulate a kind of planning uh, on the focus of, uh, say, trade-off between the environmental stresses and sustainable development. Like this, if we look at the uh, development in terms of the socioeconomic benefits, the green line is showing since 1950, we have a very good achievement. And in terms of the uh, fish production and the vegetable production, et cetera, the country uh, the very small country, but it is in the rank of second or third globally. But in terms of the supporting uh, uh, non-food ecosystem services, we, uh, we can see a number of parameters are declining. So 
Uh, so we, in the long run, the sustainable development is very difficult to achieve from this kind of system. So uh, Bangladesh government recently uh, uh, adopted a kind of long-term planning, say the Bangladesh Delta Plan, uh, with the uh, focus of the food security and economic growth, but not compromising uh, the ecosystem. So the climate change and other things will be uh, taken care. And uh, the, the time frame of this uh, plan is quite big. So it's a hundred year plan. So 2000 up to 2100 with a number of goal like uh, the milestones in the short term, medium term and long term. And uh, this plan uh, divided the country into six hotspots. Like uh, the coastal zone is one of the hotspot. And the idea is uh, the coast in, in a comparison with the global sea level rise that Alex already introduced, uh, with a range of sea level rise, the salinity intrusion may happen and what to do, something like that. So a number of science questions need to be answered to implement this kind of uh, uh, long-term planning. And uh, we, we had, uh, for the last one decade, we had a, a big team to address this issue uh, in terms of the implementation of a number of research projects, uh, for example, uh, the JICA and Japan Science and Technology supported uh, uh, project SATEFs is being implemented uh, uh, during this five-year period. And we developed a, nine, a number of tools, techniques that can be utilized to handle this kind of problem. And uh, 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 these uh, uh, will be continued further until 2014. So it's a, it's a long-term research programs. At the same time, the need for the uh, different uh, agency in the country to handle this kind of problems. And in terms of the climate change adaptation, and we have a national level adaptation plan and through uh, 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 consecutive projects since 1914 to 2000, uh, uh, until the end of this year, we have a number of activities and we are feeding the national adaptation plan and department of environmental a number of uh, research or implementation projects from this, uh, uh, this, these uh, projects. And, and uh, lastly, uh, we had a long uh, uh, history of the project with uh, the ecosystem services and poverty alleviation. And the planning commission, who are the owner of Bangladesh Delta Plan, are uh, adopted this uh, tool uh, in terms of implementation of the, uh, uh, the planning and then see how uh, effectively the long-term planning will function in terms of the biophysical changes and so socioeconomic benefits, not short-term, in, in long-term. So some of the examples, uh, for example, uh, as I explained that the sea level rise is considered as one of the dominant uh, event uh, for the salinity int uh, intrusion in the coastal zone. And uh, we have a number of numerical experiments uh, recently and uh, this is uh, the major sea level uh, salinity uh, in the coastal zone and uh, is 10 years back. And uh, after a number of ex numerical experiments, we found that the sea level rise and cyclonic events are, have some impact to increase the salinity, but these, are, these have the local effects, not the, re the, the regional or the inter region of the coastal zone. Rather, the upstream uh, reduction of the discharges are the dominant event to increase the salinity in the entire coast. But if the climate change events in terms of the sea level rise, the reduction of the upstream discharge and the super cyclone occurrence happens, then the changes of uh, the salinity in this zone will be quite high. And this, this is the changes of salinity from the beige information. So based on this information, so where we need to invest, where we need to negotiate, we, this kind of science information is very, very important. In terms of the uh, cyclonic event, we are quite successful for uh, giving some warning, uh, cyc for cyclone warning, like warning number one to 10, uh, depending on the uh, wind speed and the, uh, and the surge height. But uh, these are being implemented uh, by Bangladesh Meteorological Department. Uh, but it never can address what will be the potential for making damage for this kind of event. So uh, through uh, uh, this uh, long project, we developed the cyclone classifier model that will enable 
the policymakers and also the uh, uh, Bangladesh Meteorological Department, uh, if uh, the cyclone is going to have landfall with some specific locations, what are the potential of making damages of different infrastructures? That can be done. And um, uh, Bangladesh Meteorological Department is kindly testing uh, this tool uh, to make a couple coupling with their existing tool. So uh, uh, in terms of the innovation, actually, we have been working for the last around 20 years. So uh, to make the uh, utilization of the natural forces for the land reclamation, which is very important to compensate the sea level rise and subsidence in the coastal zone. So using a kind of traditional infrastructures uh, uh, is, uh, is low cost, like uh, the using the uh, sediment and flow uh, distribution, uh, we uh, have been working long term to make the utilization of sedimentation using this kind of structure and it's implemented in uh, some real life uh, river. And also it is extended for the coastal rivers, tidal rivers like that. So to handle the flow from both, both way upstream downstream and to make uh, the sedimentation something like that. So if this kind of tools techniques are utilized, then uh, maybe we can uh, have a more sediment trapped in the delta X surface that will uh, raise the delta uh, elevation and compensate sea level rise, something like that. So uh, if we would like to uh, have access something like physical sustainability of the coastal zone, then sedimentation is very important. So sea level rise and subsidence will make the relative sea level rise and, sub and then sedimentation thickness will make some some compensation and have the absolute syllable rise, uh, something we we can uh, explain by this equation, and uh, uh, sea level rise as we uh, summarized in the GBM uh, Bangladesh uh, system is have an average of say, relative sea level rise eight millimeter per year something like this, uh, and the sedimentation is very interesting. We have a number of uh, obstruction inside the coastal zone. So if we have a look about the sedimentation in the normal flow, uh, flood condition, the sedimentation is, uh, is, is uh, happening in some pocket area, not distributed uniformly because of this barrier. And through numerical experiment, we found that if we remove or dismantle the barriers, the sedimentation will have a kind of uniform distribution. It is not possible to dismantle, but we have to think about some kind of innovative techniques uh, that I explained earlier, something like this, that will enable us to, to derive this kind of uh, uh, sediment, uh, uh, sediment uh, accumulation. And we found that uh, around 10% more sediment can be accumulated if we have a kind of same quasi-natural system uh, is introduced in the coastal zone. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, I would like to uh, introduce some tools that is very important to uh, have a kind of appropriate adaptation in the uh, climatic, uh, climate change related hazards like uh, flooding, uh, salinization, uh, storm surge, erosion, something like that. For example, uh, for a specific, a specific kind of hazard like storm surge, the different area like uh, one specific area is uh, lacking for the adaptations of different type with some specific percentage. So the people can, the policymakers can easily understand what are the need for the, what kind of adaptations are necessary in some specific area. And they can, um, they can fulfill this adaptation, but the other adaptation needs will also change. So this is, um, this is uh, the tool we, are, uh, we have developed and it is being um, uh, considered in, in the, in the uh, uh, adaptation uh, uh, at the national adaptation planning right now. And uh, another tool that is very important to, to have the um, uh, interaction between the development and the so, some kind of trade off between the development and the ecosystem uh, services. So the Delta Dynamic Integrated Emulator Model is again a, a trademark tool that we have some kind of biophysical, socio-economical, and geographical condition in hand. And we can estimate the future changes for any kind of interventions. And to, after, after having the capability of this tool, the Bangladesh government's Delta plan uh, requested us actually, uh, how 
they can assess the impact of uh, the uh, the seawall in terms of managing the sea level rise and this project duration is until 2100 so we tested some uh, some hypothetical cases uh, in this project and then we have a number of uh, biophysical simulations and uh, uh, we found that even without making uh, uh, the um, uh, sea level rise even if we can maintain the existing design condition then it is enough to have a good uh, productivity and also protect the area from the from the uh, from the inundation and but the sea level uh, the sea walls in to to manage the sea level rise has some benefit but these are local benefits not in the entire system and uh, if we uh, would like to see these things um uh this can, this can we just hand we can handle these things in a very a clustered scale uh, so we need to have a kind of uh, uh, the system level model so we developed the system level for capturing the entire bay of bengal and also the uh, the land mass and then we can handle any kind of event like floods uh, a cyclonic event whatever uh, happening in this uh, uh, region we can capture the impact of the inter region for example uh, sir, you can see a I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to yeah, let you know we're getting close to the to the end of the time so if you could wrap up this section and so we can move on to the other panelists this is wonderful okay. so but i just want to make sure this, the the this is the end of the end of the slides Perfect. and with these things we can we can have a, a, a or challenges, but we can handle these kind of challenges, and uh, also we can have some area where we can we can collaborate each other in the internationally, nationally, whatever possible. Thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, this is that was great. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're. I just want to make sure we were on for time. That's that's wonderful. I think this is incredibly interesting, um, and uh, I just want to move on to uh, Dr. Idlalen, who is a professor of environmental law at Kadia Yad. Uh, university in in Safi, uh, Samira, uh, your your yeah. next. Yes, thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you for uh, Fulbright Association for inviting me to be part uh, to this panel. I'm happy to be here with you and to share with you uh, some uh, the experience of Morocco uh, concerning the governance of. Uh, sea level rise impacts. I will uh, uh, start by sharing my screen. Voila, it, it, it works. Yes, yes okay. you are good. You're good. I can see it. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, uh, in my presentation, I will be uh, talking about uh, sea level rise impacts and how. The governance of coastal zone in Morocco uh, is taking care uh, of, of the sea level rise impacts. First of all, I will start by, by saying a few words about, uh, about the, important, the importance of the economic uh, role of uh, coastal zone in, in, uh, in Morocco and uh, outside. I will just try to, to make the, how do you call this, the slide, uh, Play slideshow, voila. And uh, uh, I will say a few words about the economic importance of the coastal zone in Morocco. And after how uh, the sea, uh, uh, sea level rise is exacerbating other threats to the coastal zone. And uh, in the second point, I will uh, talk about the governance issues and I will end up by some lesson learned from the governance of of sea level rise in Morocco. So uh, as you can see in the map, Morocco is located in the north of Africa. Uh, it has two maritime facades, one on the Atlantic and the other one on the Mediterranean. And Morocco is very concerned with the problems, uh, um, uh, um, climate change impacts. He, uh, Morocco um, pre predictions say that we will uh, live in a, a uh, very uh, water shortage and uh, issues with agriculture, but also concerning the uh, the coastal and sea level rise and uh, the erosion, etc. So I I think I will skip a few slides in order to to be precise and fast in my presentation. 
So uh, just few statistics concerning the importance of the coastal zone. Uh, in Morocco, 55, according to 2014 statistics, 55% of the Moroccan population is actually living by the coastal zone. And uh, Morocco has developed many uh, economic, sectoral economic uh, plans that are all focused on the coastal zone. Uh, for example, the uh, tourism plan called Plan Azur, uh, it aims to attract 10 million tourists uh, to Morocco uh, by 2020. And now they will push certainly this, this, uh, this date further. And this uh, Plan Azur is actually uh, focusing on the development of seaside resorts. And uh, six seaside resorts are actually planned uh, uh, in this in this in this plan. And of course, uh, Morocco is also known for its fisheries, aquaculture, etc. And uh, Morocco uh, has also a very important cultural um, coastal zone, as you have mentioned, with uh, uh, Alex. Uh, Sidi Shashkal, that you can see here on the picture, is just. Uh, Few meter, a few kilometers from Asfi, but uh, all these uh, uh, monuments are not uh, uh, economically valued yet. They have a huge economic and uh, um, uh, cultural value. So uh, sea level rise is actually exacerbating other coastal uh, impacts uh, in, in Morocco, such as erosion. Erosion is uh, is uh, also uh, uh, due to uh, the sand mining. It's, uh, it's a big issue in Morocco. Uh, I will come back to this later. And the pollution, etc. Uh, when we talk about sea level rise, uh, is, it, it, it's, it means that it's another issue uh, problem added to uh, existing uh, problems uh, like erosion. Hello. Uh, uh, in the NDC report sent by Morocco, uh, the Moroccan government to the UNFCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, Morocco has a, uh, 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 as you can see on the slide, 72% of, of, of our coastal zone will be swallowed up, especially the beaches, will be swallowed up by the uh, sea level rise and population will, will be uh, also affected by, by the flooding. Uh, of course, these uh, impacts will, will certainly damage also the economic because uh, more uh, um, industry uh, are located, most important industries are also located by the sea. As Alex uh, has said in his uh, presentation, it is also the case for uh, Morocco, and uh, it is uh, um, in the ENDC report, uh, it is said that this sea level rise will certainly damage the coastal zone economically and environmentally. Concerning the governance issues, uh, I will try to address these four points. The first of all, that uh, sea level rise characters uh, uh, are impacting also the way it is governed by, by Morocco, but also generally. And uh, I will talk uh, about the gap between science and governance concerning uh, uh, sea level rise impacts and uh, about the definition of vulnerability of climate change to climate change, coastal vulnerability, because actually uh, this uh, definition is, is limited, as I will uh, show uh, later. And I will end up by the gap uh, between uh, the mitigation and adaptation measures taken by the Moroccan government in Morocco. So concerning the sea level rise characters that can impact governance, as you can see in this picture, uh, uh, I know that everybody knows the picture with the beer, uh, uh, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure you know this, the other picture, uh, Alex knows because he was there. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Chateau de Mer in Asfi, and uh, it was eroded. And uh, uh, as, a log, uh, as a law scholar, it is very important to make uh, um, a connection between uh, the causes and, and the impacts. Uh, 
for, for example, uh, in order to to in order, it is also true for governance because we need to make a connection between uh, what is happening locally between uh, with the, the um, sources uh, taking place globally. Uh, it is not very easy. It's complex, uh, and uh, this is one of the main uh, uh, characters of uh, sea level rise that make uh, the governance also uh, difficult. Uh, of course, when we talk about sea level rise, we talk about um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and you know that they are staying in the atmosphere for a long time. Uh, for a long time. And uh, I, I, I think that it is very difficult to, uh, to stay with certainty uh, if and how they can really impact the sea level rise. Uh, I know that, Alex, you have answers to these questions. Uh, I do not ha have this question answer. And I know that in law, especially in civil law, we need to make a, a real connection between the fact, the damage, and the what we call the lien de causalité, or the link between the two of these uh, uh, aspects. And of course, the uncertainty also is, is a problem for, for governance. Uh, there is also uh, the gap in Morocco concerning the governance of sea level rise, the gap between the science and governance. The, the map, I, I have already shown this map in a publication, as you can see, the map with the, with the map, uh, the Moroccan map with the big dots in red and uh, yellow and um, uh, green. It is showing uh, the coastal governance to climate change and uh, it is all it is uh, focusing on uh, sea level rise and and what the, the, the big dots in, in red are representing the most uh, vulnerable uh, places in the coastal zone to sea level rise in Morocco. And the other map uh, with, with green and, uh, and uh, I don't know which, <laughs> uh, uh, the other map uh, anyway, uh, is, uh, is showing the beach resorts that are uh, uh, in the program of the uh, Plan Azur, which is the tourism plan. And uh, as you can see, these, uh, these beach resorts are, are, are located in the same areas considered by uh, science because the map, the, 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 the map I just, the, um, the other map is actually done by scientific scholars uh, by the university in Morocco. And it was uh, also presented as in the report sent by the Moroccan government to to the secretariat of the UNFCC. Uh, uh, it, it means that it's science, but it's also somehow government action because it was sent to the, U uh, the United Nations. And the other map is showing uh, the contrary. And you can see that there is a big contrast between the two of them. So this gap between uh, science and, uh, and governance, we can also uh, see it in the last report sent by Morocco to uh, to the UN, uh, the NDC report, in which uh, um, it is said that the most vulnerable uh, areas for to to uh, climate change in Morocco that need to have uh, funding are water, forestry, and agriculture, and we do not uh, find uh, any uh, uh, mention to 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 coastal zone, even if, as we mentioned, I mentioned earlier. Uh, the NDC report is recognizing that coastal uh, areas are suffering from uh, sea level rise. And in the, in the figure, um, uh, in the slide, you can see uh, work done by scientific uh, scholars uh, that, uh, who are making the modulation, how do you call this, the modeling of the impacts on, of sea level rise on, uh, on beaches in Morocco and how it can uh, be, um, uh, come on, uh, and how uh, retreat, the strategy of retreat can reduce uh, the impacts of sea level rise uh, for each uh, part of the coastal zone. Uh, 
Uh, there is also the third point is the, the, the issue of definition of the coastal vulnerability to, uh, uh, to climate change. Uh, actually, in the map, uh, I, I just showed earlier uh, with the big dots in red. Uh, in this map, uh, it was done by scientific scholars, as I said, but the vulnerability is, is only uh, considered from the point of view of uh, nature. Uh, for example, how uh, sea level rise can impact uh, differently uh, a coastal zone with cliffs uh, um, rather than a coastal zone with, uh, how could you say, sandy beaches. Uh, and they, they, all these are characters or uh, parameters that are um, scientific uh, or natural. But uh, when we talk about um, uh, vulnerability to climate change, we need also to add to these uh, other characters or parameters, like for, for example, the governance uh, characters, who are the stakeholders and, and how they are uh, interacting on the coastal zone. Um, what are the plans actually in place uh, for uh, governing the coastal zone, etc. And we need also to take into account the rule of law uh, because all these aspects are, are combining, uh, combined, uh, play a big role on the vulnerability to climate change, coastal vulnerability at least. Uh, for example, the issue of sand mining in Morocco is involving also uh, issues uh, uh, like corruption, etc. And this should also be uh, in the Calcul uh, in the uh, you know in the um, in the definition of of the uh, coastal vulnerability to climate change. Uh, the gap between science and uh, uh, ah, yes, there is. Uh, sorry, I wanted to talk uh, just just to explain this 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 figure about coastal adaptation. Uh, you know that coastal adaptation, according to international community, can be done uh, through three main uh, strategies, the retreat, accommodation, and protection. And uh, in most uh, aspects, uh, protection. Uh, 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 however, protection against sea level rise is not uh, done uh, um, in the same way uh, for all coastal areas. Actually, uh, the government chose to protect uh, special areas that are considered economically valuable and uh, um, uh, not to protect the other areas. Uh, for example, in this picture, you can see uh, the wall uh, um, in order to protect uh, the mosque, uh, Hassan II, which is a very, very important monument in Morocco uh, and the uh, Mansoum, uh, Mohammed Mansoum is uh, have a, a paper on this explaining the strategy of Morocco uh, um, towards the uh, protection uh, or strategies of adaptation uh, in the coastal zone. So in some places we protect, but and we use hard tools for protecting the coastal zone. And in other, uh, uh, in other uh, areas, we uh, just, uh, as you can see here in ASFI, uh, uh, population were, were, was displaced and uh, the buildings were destroyed. And uh, the, that was the solution uh, uh, found by local authority in order to adapt to uh, erosion, at least. I don't know if it's sea level rise because uh, Alex, you know, it's very complex to really say if it's sea level rise of is, or if it is just erosion. And uh, for law, unfortunately, we cannot uh, just, uh, you know, speculate. We have to know for sure if what are, the causes, what are the reasons for, for the damage. Uh, there is also, as I said earlier, this is the, the last point, uh, con uh, concerning the gap between mitigation adaptation and coastal adaptation at least, uh, Morocco has undertaken a very uh, huge policy for mitigation to the 
greenhouse gas emissions mitigation and the, it has uh, we have um, several uh, legal texts uh, uh, morocco is the one of is the first country in africa to develop renewable energies however considering the adaptation to the coastal to sorry to climate change uh, there is a contrast between the, these two measures, especially concerning coastal adaptation. Uh, the adaptation measures undertaken by the government uh, in Morocco are more focused on agriculture, as you have seen in the NDC report, and water, uh, but not for coastal uh, areas. Why? I think because it's very complex and uh, because um, uh, I, I maybe it's because it's very complex and also because it's difficult to put uh, uh, numbers on it to to have uh, to assess uh, what are the real impacts in the long term because uh, we have to calculate uh, the impacts for the long term and you know that governance has a short term so and also it's difficult to put these numbers into the ENDC uh, reports because the NDCs are based on, on numbers we have to to evaluate uh, uh, etc however as we have now a new coastal law in Morocco in 2015 and this law can be uh, can be can be applied through uh, schemes like for example uh, regional coastal schemes uh, uh, I think that this uh, the the coastal adaptation can be uh, done through these uh, coastal uh, these regional coastal uh, schemes. Um, that means that we need to redefine the coastal vulnerability to climate change uh, in Morocco in a pluridisciplinary approach because it is very important uh, uh, to uh, to assess what will be the impacts of sea level rise in Morocco in the long term. Voila, thank you for your attention and uh, welcome to our annual forum. This is another picture of uh, Safi, not only with eroded Chateau de Mer, uh, uh, and uh, we have an annual forum in Morocco, so you are welcome. It's a forum for students. Thank you, Alex, thank you. Hey. Thank you. That was that was great. That was that was absolutely fascinating. I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, we'll uh, we'll move on to to Alexandra Ham, uh, Harrington, who is a uh, professor of law at, uh, at at Albany Law School. Alexandra, do you want to uh, you want to kick it off? Of course, I will be happy to. Thank you, Alex. And I I never do PowerPoints well. I'm told that I always make them too wordy or too annoying. So um, I will just speak. So I apologize, it will be the last, you know, presentation will be left to story time. But um, to follow up on these two really just impressive and I think highly insightful presentations, I wanted to provide a bit of kind of framing context because we've seen such really um, detailed understandings emerging from Bangladesh, from Morocco, um, as you've also alerted to, alluded to Alex from Louisiana as well, that I wanted to give a bit of a brief background on international environmental law and governance, and then talk about uh, in particular the NDCs that uh, Samira had touched on and what they indicate to us about sea level rise and migration as a really durable issue that um, will pervade environmental law and well beyond into the future. And also just mention one or two other things that the um, institute, various institutes have, and the International Organization for Migration have come up with um, that really do drive home the need for us to address the loss of sea level um, stability and the fluctuation of sea level as something that is a driver of much more than um, one form of harm, but really can have many different impacts, which taken together can be quite disturbing. Um, so to, to give a little bit of, of background and information, as Samira has pointed out, the, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is the, um, the overriding structure, the overarching structure within which international environmental law 
is, at least in the climate change level, is largely created. And the uh, UNFCCC system came into existence in 1992. Um, it was intended to be just what its name says, a framework. And so the idea is to, in the, the text, is to identify what the greenhouse gases are, what the greatest threats are to the international community and various national communities, and then figure out how to address these threats and the threat of climate change as it has emerged over time and as it emerged from 1992 onwards with the understanding that the knowledge, both scientifically and legally, um, and societally in 1992 would be very different than what it is in 2021 or even you know, 10 years later, that it constantly was an emerging trend. So we saw then in 1997, the creation of the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change did a number of things which are fascinating, not necessarily relevant to this discussion, um, but fascinating in the sense that it created the first uh, steps for international climate markets and national climate markets and climate trading, um, the ways in which various types of credits would be accumulated for a number of different countries um, that have really given rise to things like the European Union's um, emissions trading system. But what is telling is that it, by this point, we have gone from in five years, 1992, setting out a framework, 1997, figuring out that this framework will work for markets and that it will need to address an environmental question and issue from an economic point of view, taking into account the social elements that we see and developmental elements that we see in different countries at different levels. And so there are annexes in the, uh, the Kyoto Protocol in particular, which say the various types of countries that would be eligible to use what we consider now to be carbon markets or cap and trade systems. Um, this system functioned until Technically until 2011, it still has continued on to a certain extent in that various elements of, um, of the carbon trading systems and reporting have been phased into the next step, which was the Paris Agreement. And so in 2022, hopefully they will be phased out largely when we're able to one assumes, one hopes, um, begin again with the Conference of the Parties uh, system, which is the annual meeting of the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, where we have policies and developments come in and where we have updates as necessary for any type of instrument under the UNFCC system. In uh, 2015, so there was a gap of several years, but in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement gave rise to what we now consider to be the most kind of comprehensive viewpoint of what climate change is, what its parameters are, not just from an environmental standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint and a societal standpoint. Um, and the various types of communities that will be impacted by climate change moving forward. And the Paris Agreement is much more of a fulsome statement on what types of impacts we can expect, obviously understanding that there will be new ones in the future that we didn't understand at the time could happen, such as a pandemic, for example, um, but also that we have a number of different obligations being created. We have financial obligations, we have reporting requirements, we have reporting obligations, and that there needs to be a type of overarching system or set of systems and set of committees where we see the reporting and the um, evaluation of these reports come together critically so that we can understand how various states are putting their obligations into effect and then what their common identified issues are moving forward. And to do this, to police this um, and to ensure compliance, there has been the creation of the na Nationally Determined Contribution or NDC um, reporting system. There initially was what was termed the INDC system, 
um, which because we love acronyms in international law, we just do, it's just a great thing to have, um, which was the, in 2016, the initial intended nationally determined contributions. What are we intending to do for each nation that ratified the Paris Agreement or signed on to the Paris Agreement in order for us to meet our obligations as a nation under the Paris Agreement. We have seen subsequent filings of NDCs, so taking the intended off, and this is what we're actually doing now as the next step and the next iteration. Those have been coming in. Um, we intended to have a number more come in last year. Obviously, 2020 changed a great deal. Um, and we had intended a global stock take to be finished by 2023. We are awaiting guidance right now to see what that will look like, if it will still look at 2023 as a goal, or if we might move this back. Many of you will know that the annual conference of the parties last year was scheduled to be held in Glasgow and has been um, rescheduled to hopefully Glasgow this year, um, but we do need to have that meeting before anything else can be put into effect. I mentioned the NDCs and Samira did as well because they really do tell us the most evolved plans for states as to how they view climate change, not only what they plan to do from law, but also how they understand climate change and the threats to their individual states and populations. And with that in mind, um, I've actually done a survey and I, I did it last night to make sure nothing else new popped in of the NDCs that have been filed to look at the various sea level rise related issues specifically, and also migration, because migration has been something that has been danced around in the international community on um, and the concept of how we define migration and environmental causes, but it's something that is understood by everyone from environmental law experts to migration experts and human rights experts as increasing due to climate change, um, especially sea level rises, and as typically impacting those communities that are the most vulnerable. Um, whether it be in terms of internal migration, internally displaced peoples going between various states within or points within a state, or external migration across borders, generating what we would in other perhaps political contexts call refugees, but at this point we still don't have a definition for. So looking through the NDCs, what we take note of right away is this understanding that sea level rise will have very long lasting, very deep um, impacts across the board in economy and in habitability. And the economy and habitability elements come together to be drivers of migration and drivers of migration, both from coastal communities to perhaps larger inland cities or larger cities per se, even if they are coastal areas because they are considered to be more built up and more economically developed, as well as the rise in sea level causing everything from health issues to um, dietary and biodiversity related issues, malaria, a number of various uh, communicable diseases and also malnourishment and even lack of water, lack of uh, at least potable water. We also have noticed a number of countries coming across the board everywhere from um, the South Pacific to the Caribbean to um, Cape Verde and to, uh, to Egypt in particular as highlighting the stresses that internal and external migration will play on their plans for future handling of climate change because as they are seeking to understand who their tax bases will be, who their populations will be, what they will need, uh, where they will need services, et cetera, this type of uncertainty that is caused when the sea level rises and you can no longer live in a place, you can no longer have your economic uh, income derived from a place, it is no longer safe for you to be there for the full year, it then changes the way in which we all understand the legal and the policy planning um, going forward. So as we see this coming to the UNFCCC system in the nationally determined contribution reports, obviously this is very important for each state. It's also very important for the evolution of climate migration concepts and for the environmental law context at the international level, because this is something that we do know 
will be increasingly on the agenda for Glasgow. It was at least touched on in many um, capacities in the subsequent conferences of the parties from Paris onwards. And we do know that it is something that is getting a great deal more attention at the policy level. And particularly when we're seeing a number of these countries that have highlighted sea level rise and migration as being so important and determinative in their NDCs also be very heavily hit by COVID, uh, particularly islands uh, that had depended on tourism and income from tourism for most of their national ability to, to finance anything. Um, we are really faced with an existential crisis that is identifying things like sea level rise as not only potential issues, but as, as an issue that needs to be created in whatever planning for Build Back Better might look like going into the future. Um, so that really is the, the international law and environmental law view on uh, migration and sea level rise. The other thing to note briefly, and then I would love to just take more questions than anything else, um, is that when we're talking about migration from sea level rise or any other form of climate change um, or climate change related activity or effect, there is no definition that we would think of now that is fully applicable. We have a definition of refugees and most often even very seasoned lawyers will make a, a an error in calling people climate refugees. Um, they are not climate refugees in the sense that the legal definition of a refugee at the international level and most national levels is someone who is fleeing persecution. And even lawyers as very talented as we are as at stretching definitions and ideas typically cannot stretch persecution to include climate change or environmental effects. So it really is inapplicable. At the same time, many other definitions of migrant do not have the same uh, necessity element that one finds when one finds a population that's been pushed out because of sea level rise or other inability to inhabit a certain area. Um, certainly economic migration alone does not necessarily seem to cover this type of um, of driver of migration. So we are facing a question, we have faced it for many years in the international law community of how to define um, those who have been migrants due to environmental concerns and climate change. Sea level rise is perhaps one of the starkest examples of this because we will, according to all projections, see island nations go into uninhabitable areas very quickly in terms of sea level rise triggering their uninhabitability within 10 years, 20 years, 30 years at the most. And then we will have a very real question of how do we handle a largely stateless at that point population. Um, so it is something that certainly I continue to work in, a number of my colleagues work in as well, um, and it has been a portion of my Fulbright research. So I'm happy to take questions. I have no really good answers other than that we need to do something, but um, you know, at least realizing it is I think half the problem maybe quarter of the problem. So I will stop here so that we can get to some questions. But Alex, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone at Fulbright for allowing us to get together and have these exchanges, even when we're all stuck in our respective corners of the world. Well, thank you. That was that was great. I think all of these questions were, all these presentations were, were fantastic. Um, I think we have a lot of questions. I'm going to just start off with one as, you know, as a scholar, and just ask, you know, as scholars where we research, what are what are the biggest unknowns that you think we face, that each of you think we face looking looking forward? Uh, maybe Munzer, we'll just start with you. What what do you think is the biggest unknown out there? Um I, I think um the the planning and then implementation um, uh, has a number of uh, gaps uh, with the science. And uh, for the uh, scientific community, I think we have a number of limitations till now that we don't know many things. So uh, I think the continuous uh, research, the need-based research is very important. And uh, uh, if any coastal zone, these kind of uh, good research outcomes are generated, this can be replicable uh, at, the, uh, at some other places. 
to save the resources and time. So I think from my experience working with the government and the planning sector, that this is the big gaps. People usually think that they can do it, but they don't know how they can do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's someone that I certainly see that as someone, you know, Louisiana, we have a large coastal program and communicating with policymakers and figuring out what can and can't be done is certainly an issue that we see here in Louisiana where there are coastal issues at the fore. Samira, your, your thoughts on, um, on some of the biggest unknowns from your perspective? Um. Can you, Alex? Can you repeat? I could not catch. Oh, oh! I was just, I was just. Oh, I just turned it. I wanted to turn it to Samira on your, from your perspective. What is the biggest? Yes. What are the biggest questions that are out there? What are the biggest unknowns that you think that we face from your perspective? Oh, it's a trick. <laughs> there are a lot of unknowns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you may you mean announced for uh, the impacts of sea level rise? Yeah, from the impacts from sea level rise as you see it. What are the biggest questions that we things that would make it easier? What are the biggest things that the best information that you would want to see to make it easier to plan for sea level rise? Or or the biggest questions that you think we face? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yes, there are a lot of questions. Uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, there is the, the, the issue of uncertainty. Uh, it is very difficult to predict what are the uh, impacts of sea level rise on the coastal zone uh, for each coastal zone. And this is a big issue for, for local authority and the, the government to address because we do not know what are the real impacts and we need to have an assessment for every coastal zone to make sure uh, that what will be the the impacts i don't know if it's uh, the yeah. the answer the answer to your yeah. question that it's a good it's a good good one alexandra did you want to um did oh, you want to ask and, and then i see some questions or or answer i see some questions are coming in from the audience and so we'll get we'll get to those too um, Alexander, if you wanted to chime in, and then I'll, I'll move to some of these. Uh, Absolutely. Questions. I mean, I think that you know, COVID has shown us that everything is, in a sense, an unknown. Um, the future is an unknown. But um, I think, from the research perspective, almost um, to continue on from what Monsoon had pointed out, when we get to the legal research perspective and advising on policy, et cetera, you can see wonderful laws and wonderful policies, but the unknown is how they will go into effect in practice and what they will do in practice. And unfortunately, that's something that is very difficult to control as an unknown, um, both because of human nature and because of the practicality of the world, but it is always daunting and it is always there. Great. And I've seen some questions come in. And so if people want to add more questions, put them in the either the Q&A or the chat. But I see uh, two questions from Nancy Wright. The first one is for Samira um, and she writes, you know, you say, and quite understandably that adaptation is more complex than mitigation. Would you agree, however, that adaptation allows for, for more autonomy? Migration depends on other factors uh, over whom you have uh, little or no control. So such as uh, superpower carbon emissions. Um, so, would you say, would you agree that adaptation is more complex yes. than mitigation or, or, but that adaptation allows for more autonomy? Yes, yeah. When I say that adaptation is complex, it's because actually for coastal zone, at least, we have three strategies that you all know, uh, the retreat, the accommodation and the protection. And uh, these uh, strategies, uh, are very difficult actually to put into work because how can we know, for example, which strategy to choose? That's why I said it's it's uh, it's complex. Uh, mitigation, uh, yeah, mitigation is also complex actually because we do not need to mitigate only our greenhouse gas emissions uh, in in one country, but also to take into account the global greenhouse gas emissions, and this is really also very complex. Everything is complex, actually. 
And I, I, I have actually, uh, uh, talking about this, uh, I don't know, maybe in the United States you have litigation on this aspect, you know? Uh, for example, I wonder uh, in Morocco if we can, for example, bring suits against uh, Spain, because Spain, they have a lot of factories and they cause greenhouse gas emissions. And we do not, Morocco is not a very big gas, greenhouse gas emission emitter. And uh, I don't know, uh, maybe in, in the United States, you have this kind of litigations. Yeah. Alexander, you want to chime in on yeah, that? I was going to say, definitely. So, um, Samira, we do. Um, it's not been as successful in the US so far as it has been in, for example, in the Netherlands with the Agenda case and some of the cases that have followed out of Ireland, went to, um, Irish environment, etc. But we do have an increasing number of cases that are climate justice cases, um, often brought by younger uh, either students or young adults who are alleging in the US context, it's more of a constitutional violation. Um, in certainly in our agenda and in the Friends of Irish Environment case is the argument that there was a domestic um, violation of constitutional and administrative procedure law, as well as international law commitments that have been undertaken. Um, we may see more of that in the US now that the US has rejoined the Paris Agreement because that will then start to place additional pressures on us. So we may in the next few years see it. At this point, we don't have as much yet, but um, there is hope. At least there is a chance for that. Yeah. Um, but it, it does also depend on the forum and the context because for Morocco to have a suit against a larger emitter in Europe, for example, Spain, you would have to find the appropriate um, plaintiffs who would have standing and then also the appropriate uh, body which would be willing to hear it. And so it is a much more complex question that I would love to talk to you more about more later. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. great. I hope you guys, I hope you two can connect later. Um, hey, I see another question, Alexandra, for yeah. you. So from uh, another one from Nancy Wright. Um, and she writes, uh, as I'm sure you know, a few South Pacific islands to date gave uh, reported no cases of COVID. These islands mm -hmm. uh, are also places that depend on tourism, but not the same crowds as many Caribbean islands. These South Pacific islands have also uh, started their own uh, adaptability to climate change and globalization. For them, the isolation that has cut them off from much of the world seems to have shielded them from COVID. Do you see their struggle as different from those of other islands? And she continues, I'm thinking, for example, uh, Tongo, uh, Tuvalu, uh, Kiribati, Nauru, and Palau. Um, yeah. Alexandra, do you want to do you want to answer that? Oh, absolutely. So I think uh, Nancy, it's an excellent question. I think they are different in different struggles in the sense that um, the Caribbean states that have been so much more harshly hit. And again, it's it's difficult because when we look at some numbers, like the numbers coming out of India, where you have you know, 300,000 new cases a day, it doesn't seem that the Caribbean islands have been hit harshly at all. And yet in relation to their population, they have. Um, they are facing an existential threat and crisis because of their economies, because of the way that they're based. Um, and the way that they had projected certainly their own ability to have adaptation and, and mitigation measures financed. Um, in the context of many of the islands you mentioned, the reason that they are not necessarily huge tourist sites in the same way the Caribbean is, uh, has to do with many of the climate and environmental issues that make them very vulnerable to climate change issues. And they are, um, with the exception of the Maldives, which is very much a tourist hub, they are not necessarily the most tourist uh, driven economies because they have either already suffered or are about to suffer impending climate change related um, issues in that just don't make them really attractive to tourists. At the same time, their existential struggle comes from this and their inability to maintain um, any type of guarantee of a beachfront property for the next 10 years without it going underwater will certainly dissuade tourist um, hotels and venues from opening or from upgrading, et cetera. So they are different struggles. Um, they're all touched by the same common themes. It's a question of what variant of those themes we have. Thanks. Um, so, hey, I see another, a really interesting question that's sort of on a similar vein from uh, Mustafa Hussein. 
Um, and, and he has a question to uh, Munzer and Alexandra and writes, it, it's rather easy to, to migrate from a place to another in a country like Canada, USA, or Australia due to sea level rise or, or other climate hazards. But what about uh, small, densely populated countries like Bangladesh, uh, in where, um, where people may be uh, forced to live in very harsh conditions or mar migrate to uh, various places? How does Munzer, maybe how, does, how do you think of the migration issues in Bangladesh differ from other places around the world? Yeah. So in, in Bangladesh, uh, our understanding about the migration is mostly from the vulnerable area to the big cities like Dhaka, Chittagong, uh, Kula, this kind of city. And these cities are already densely populated, uh, over densely populated, you can say. So uh, uh, the approach uh, that uh, the government and also uh, from our research uh, area is to make the coastal vulnerable area more enable for living, like uh, ensuring safety, security, work opportunity, and other uh, uh, growth centers, etc. That will uh, enable the people to do, live there and not to migrate. Because migration in the big cities will never solve the problem. Uh, rather, uh, creating enabling environment in the regional area uh, uh, should be the better choice in a densely populated country like Bangladesh. Great, thanks. Um, Alexander, you wanna chime in? On, yeah, on that? I, I think, um, first of all, I, I absolutely agree. But also I think that this is the type of issue where you see the necessity of, um, of having an international understanding of how we define climate migrants or whatever we might call them really is, is critical because we, in these situations where it's easy to go from one place to another, relatively easy, it's not as much of an issue to have a question of who you are internationally, but where you do have many unattractive choices, potentially if you stay home or if it's unattractive to have even more people coming into a city. So there will be efforts to stop that by a national government or a city government or a, a regional government. Um, then you will have the international migration issues that come up. And so these type of issues are much more durable and they, they definitely will need answers coming from all of us from scientists and lawyers working together into the future to figure out how we craft something that will be long lasting and actually help people who do need to be able to go somewhere else because the reality is they won't be able to stay at home no matter what their choices might be. These are certainly issues we've seen in Louisiana on migration of who, who is a migrant and who counts as a migrant. So one thing we've noticed here is a lot of people are leaving the low lying coastal areas for the big cities, which might be the pattern that you'd expect with climate change or sea level rise or land loss. But there's also a question of, is that just economic migration as the fishing industry has changed and as jobs have moved to the big cities, people are, are they leaving low lying areas because they're flooding more frequently or are they going to the larger cities because there's more jobs there? Um, but it's also a question of, you know, what's safe and what's not safe. People have left some of the low lying areas for, for cities like Homa, which is a small city or New Orleans, which is a medium sized city or, or Houston. And of course, none of those areas are, they might have reduced risk, but they're by no means, um, they're by no means risk-free. So people are still, um, even if they move somewhere, they, they may not move to a, they move, move to a less risky environment, but certainly not a, a zero risky environment because all of those places have experienced floods. So the question of where people go why and where people go is certainly one issue that we're dealing with in, in this part of the United States. Um, I just to, just to be fair, just to see, I see a question. Does anyone have any uh, research connect with climate change with outer space development or polar region development? You know, certainly as a scientist, I know, um, I just see that as a question from Eddie the Weeks and I'll just, you know, throw that out there. Um, and, you know, certainly we're all concerned about, you know, even though I don't study ice caps and, and glaciers melting, I think we're all concerned about that as an issue of, of sea level rise. Anyone just wanna connect their research with other parts of the other parts of the world? Is there anything just to answer that question? 
so strangely, but um, the, the space issue does come up actually for me a lot um, in that from the sustainable development side, at least in the, the implementation of the sustainable development goals, this is an area that I've been asked to contribute to a bit more recently and looking at whatever our concept of the environment in space might be, how do we make sure that basically the, the sins of the earth do not get carried forward? And how do we understand whatever it might not obviously be rising sea levels, but how do we understand whatever um, the environmental issues are in space and on planets in a way that we don't replicate what we've already done? Also understanding that we not perhaps drive our, our goals too quickly in space because we need things to take the place of resources we've lost on Earth. That's great, yeah. I think that's a question. The yeah, question of geoengineering has come up. Do people, um, and I'm not, I wouldn't even pretend to be an expert on this, but do people, you know, put mirrors in space to sun, to, sh to sign, send sunlight back, block, block sunlight off of the Earth? Um, certainly those are issues that have come up. I, I'm not an expert on those. Um, are there other questions from the audience? What I don't see any more, but why don't I turn it to the three of you? Do you eat, uh, do any of you have a question for the other for each other? Yeah, Samira. Yeah, yes, I I have heard uh, that um, uh, Mansoor, you have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said you have a national adaptation plan in Bangladesh. Is, is this plan, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, coastal zone is integrated in this plan? Uh, coastal zone adaptation, coastal adaptation? Yeah, um, in the national adaptation plan, uh, the entire Bangladesh is considered, but with uh, a big emphasis on the coastal zone, because coastal zone is the most uh, vulnerable uh, zone in terms of additional stresses like uh, cyclone, salinity, etc. The other area in Bangladesh are mostly flooding and riverbank uh, erosion, land erosion, but uh, the four uh, consecutive hazards are uh, 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 existing in the coastal zone. And uh, coastal zone is one of the important area where the government is uh, uh, implementing the adaptation plans since 2004. So, uh, so each, at each stage, we are improving the situation, updating the situation. And um, uh, basically, that I uh, explained earlier, uh, when people are talking about the adaptation, we will do that thing, this thing, this will work, something like that. Uh, we have never... Uh, being test, testing this thing that is of doing something to create other things. So the science behind uh, uh, these, uh, the, the, the future, future emerging new problems uh, need to be considered. So adaptations are not straightforward to solve some problem. We are implementing something. Rather, it should be a kind of holistic and you know the coastal zone and other zones in a very small country like Bangladesh are very closely linked because the rivers, the tidal uh, 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 exposure, the salinity exposure, et cetera, are covering almost naturally by the one third of the land and other, other area are very, very linked. So, so adaptations when we are talking about only the coastal zone, uh, I think it's not a valid point for a country like Bangladesh, where the entire country is a kind of delta. So, so yeah. yeah, these are the things yeah. that really happening in Bangladesh. Okay, thank Great. you, Alexandra or, or Monsur. Do you have questions for 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 anyone else? Yeah, actually, um, uh, uh, for for uh, Samira, uh, I have one thing, and for. Uh, Alexandria, uh, another, another thing is uh, uh, the, the situation in Morocco and the postal problem situation in Bangladesh, I think, is quite different. Yes, yeah, uh, I think so. Because, yeah. because we are experiencing uh, big, uh, uh, draining the big basin catchment and then 
GTing within Bangladesh in a very tiny small country. So, so the stresses uh, are quite different. And uh, learning from one country to another country may be slightly vary uh, to, to add up. So, uh, so I, I'm not sure exactly, I, I didn't have time to study the situation in Morocco, but I think the problem is generating within the country, is it? Yes, or that's it's coming true, yeah. from the border country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you mean so it is relatively it is relatively easier to handle this kind of uh, problem when the problem is generating within the country. Uh, yes. Yeah. But but yeah. the problem is how to make sure it's is it is generated from from the country because sea level rise it has. Oh yeah. yeah global. Yeah, yeah. Global sources, that's the issue. Yeah, actually, sea level rise together with the tidal amplitude are the resultant water level raging situation. So, in Bangladesh, if we go from west to east, the tidal amplitude varies from two meter to seven meter. So, it's a big difference. So, natural tidal amplitude is varying from two meter to seven meter. So, so the 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 the, the uh, mitigation or adaptation, whatever you say, um, uh, are quite different scale in the west and eastern part. And yes. uh, if the sea level rise is the added parameter, then again, it's, it's a big challenge. I think, I think because of the uh, geography, topography, and the uh, large basin area, um, this is different and. Uh, to Alexandria, I think one important issue that we, when we implemented um, uh, a project that is whether the migration is a kind of adaptation in the Delta. So we studied in three Delta, like uh, in, in the GBM, uh, India, Bangladesh, and Mahanodi Delta in India, and also Volta Delta in Ghana. And then um, uh, in different uh, Delta, the outcomes are a little bit different. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, in a densely populated country like, like Bangladesh, it is very difficult to let the people migrate to the big cities. Rather, um, enabling or living uh, environment creation in the local region is the better choice, if possible. If unavoidable, then it can be. But in Bangladesh, another migration that, is, that you mentioned about the international migration, is, is very much encouraged because of the, the remittance and other uh, support uh, to, to the country. But internal migration is very, very difficult to accommodate, like uh, mass scale. And people are living after migration uh, uh, internally, they are not living good life, actually. Uh, they are living a very, a very, very stressful life. Uh, maybe the economy is, is a little better, but the living condition, uh, the, the ecosystem and other services they are deprived of after migration. Yeah, so, those were some of the, so, yeah, that, that, that's great. Those were some of the questions that I think the Mustafa Hussein had on his, um, as his question of like, how do we, how is Bangladesh, you know, different from a, from a U.S. kind of country where um, I think that, that's, that those issues are very, were, you know, a little bit addressed by Mustafa. Yeah. Of course, I see the contrast between, you know, for me as someone that I never worked in Bangladesh, but of course, you know, Munster, you know, my, my PhD advisor, Steve Goodbread, who had worked there. And I see Bangladesh in some ways as similar to Louisiana and maybe Morocco is quite different, right? Because Bangladesh, you, you're sinking, you're a Delta. Morocco, you know, the, the coastline isn't moving too much and it's a much drier coast with, with fewer rivers. So I see it as a, as a contrast. Um, hey, I just want to be mindful of time. You know, we're about 1.30 and this is probably about the end of, or 1.30 East uh, Central time in my, in my country or my time zone. Um, do we have any, I just want to be mindful of the time. Do we have any sort of closing thoughts and final, final words before we, uh, before we close? I think this has just been fantastic. Um, any, any final, final closing thoughts as we try to wrap up? Um, I, I, one thing that I wanted to uh, uh, talk in the presentation that is 
actually uh, from this kind of forum um, and the way forward the collaboration the the future working environment uh, uh, generation of the future working environment is important so we are working in different area with different problems but uh, if we can join each other then the global problem uh, like sea level rise is a coastal problems are quite different in each of the countries but the sea level rise the one driver is more or less same so so how the same sea level rise is creating different level of problems in different country is is a matter of question so how we can handle this things in a I, think that, I think that that's a great question um and and yeah i think it's yeah every coastal zone is different but coasts are one of the most widely distributed habitat you know almost half the world's population lives lives near the coast so i think that that's a fundamental question um samira or alexandra you want to just give some thoughts on that as a closing closing thought or any other close or any other closing thought that you might have Sure, I, I will be happy to. So no, I, I think that it does highlight um, the necessity of, of having an international discussion about how do we create an international legal system that is broad enough and flexible enough to take into account the differences that do exist. Um, but at the same time, recognizing that we do need to have some type of uniformity, some type of common language, some type of common system for oversight and for reporting. Um, a lot of that does technically exist or could exist under the aegis of the Paris Agreement if it is properly um, handled in the future and hopefully can be handled this year in November, um, but we'll definitely see. But I think that really is an amazing point just to, to highlight how important it is that we all keep having these conversations as lawyers and scientists and scholars in general, um, because we do need to work together rather than just talking from different points of view. So. In that sense, I just want to say thank you, Alex, for bringing us all together because it's it's been wonderful and, to hear from other perspectives too. And 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 bringing together is really the the, the purpose of Fulbright. So um, I just I just at this time made a made a you know a few emails and a few phone calls to to all of you. But but Fulbright is I think that a, a forum to bring people together and to have these have these common exchanges um, and and find some level of of common dialogue. Um, I, I just, uh, I see that someone had asked about, um, you know, can we get a recording of this webinar? And I believe that the Fulbright Association will be, will be putting this recording online. So I think you should be able to find it at the Fulbright Association's webpage. Samira, do you have any, any final thoughts before we let people go? Yeah, no, just to say uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, inviting me to be part of this very interesting webinar. And also that I'm looking for, for, for uh, your data from the evaluation of. Yes, let's talk about that offline and I will be providing you with some, I can get give you some of that. Um, and I did see also you had your, 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 your seminar uh, at your at your institute in in um, in June, so I just want to take yes. say thank you yeah. all for for coming, um, and and thanks you thank the thanks uh, Samira, Alexandra, and Munzer for for participating. This was great, um, and I want to thank um, thank the Fulbright Association for for pulling this together, and I want to thank everyone out in the audience for for listening. So shukran, merci beaucoup, muchas gracias. Um, thank you all. And uh, Ramadan uh, Mubarak and, and happy Earth Day to all of you. So thanks to all of you. And I thank hope you, that Alex. a thank wonderful you. rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Bye, Alexandra Mansour. Bye, Samira. Bye, Mansour. Bye, Alex. Thanks so Bye. much to our entire panel for this forum. And um, thank you to the members and donors. Thank you, Munir. I mean, possible. Um, our upcoming forums are May 4th, May 11th, and May 27th, and you can see them on the calendar. And have a great day.